just a short word today, because I'm wearing more clothes than you, so when Father gets too hot, we know we're done. Um, St. Ignatius of Loyola has a really key insight into the spiritual life. He says this, he says, the bad spirit oftentimes begins by giving pleasure and then later distress. Whereas the good spirit often brings fear, but then afterwards peace. We see that very clearly in the gospel, don't we? They are terrified when they see Jesus, but then he brings peace. This is really important because a lot of times people have very profound religious experiences. And they're like, wow, wasn't that such an amazing experience? I always say, look at the fruit of what happens afterwards. Very important. You do not judge a religious experience based upon what happens in the moment because you could be deceived. You are never deceived, however, by the fruit. If the fruit is greater faith, hope, and charity, it came from God. If there is not greater faith, hope, and charity, I don't care what you experienced, it was not from God. Does everyone get that? Really important, because a lot of people have great mystical experiences, and then they go and cheat on their spouse, or they go and they live a life that's contrary to the gospel, and they say, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a lie. But I had such a great experience, Father. I don't care. <laughs> The devil can give great experiences. That's why so many people are trapped in the sins of the flesh. Because the sins of the flesh feel great. And you can convince yourself of all kinds of things, can't you? But you can't argue with fruit of faith, hope, and love. Because those things are never the fruit of sin. Right? You can take that to the bank. So believe that, friends. The Holy Spirit will oftentimes scare the pants off of you. Okay? Okay? Because if you look at the Old Testament, you see very clearly that what's the response? You cover your face, right? The people of Israel, when God appeared on Mount Sinai, what happened? They're like, keep away from us. We're going to die. Moses, you go talk to him, right? You talk to God. We'll stay over here. We're terrified of him. Because when we really understand, when we really see God as he is, you realize he's your creator. He made you. He can unmake you like that. A lot of people are like, oh, God's my buddy. You know, it's like, you are not buddies with God. Let's be real clear about this. God is not your buddy by any right. He's only your buddy because he lowers himself to be with us. We got to get that real clear in our heads because a lot of people just think Jesus is just like, you know, he's just like one of the guys, right? Yes, he is a human. He has a human nature, but he's a divine person, right? He's not a human being. He's a divine person who has a human nature as well. So we got to really say that very clearly, right? God has lowered himself to be with us, but that we don't deserve that. We should never be comfortable with it, right? And we get too comfortable with God. I, as a priest who handle the divine mysteries every day, I get way too comfortable with this reality because God could unmake me at any second. <laughs> and so I need to have a little bit more holy fear of him, right? He loves us, absolutely, right? That's why you're here. You're not sitting here because he hates you, right? You're sitting here because he loves you. He doesn't make garbage. He doesn't make stuff that he hates. Your very existence is proof of his love for you. But friends, we have to recognize we are the recipients of a gift we don't deserve. And that's the foundation of our gratitude. I was driving up to Portland today. Uh, sister Therese up at the Our Lady of Peace, she celebrated her 50th anniversary of being a sister. And I just and I just I just thought, wow, I'm going to be like 78 when I have my 50th, <laughs> please God. But like, it's just one of those things where I'm going, wow, what fidelity. And I was just thinking about like how grateful she was, and I'm going, I really don't express gratitude very well. Like, and I, I have to look at my heart and realize I'm just not good at gratitude. I mean, I'm doing a better job than I am now, than I used to. But like, I look at it and I go, wow, gratitude. I got to grow in it because. I get too comfortable with the reality that I'm a priest and that I have a parish and that you guys like most of the stuff I do, <laughs> right? The fact is, is that I can get very comfortable with that and I take it for granted, but all of it can be taken away in a second. We can become ill, we can become injured, we can lose everything in a moment and we need to be thankful to God right now. Don't we? For wherever you are right now, you need to be thankful to him because friends, our life is a storm. A life is a storm. That's really what this gospel is about. It's saying, look, the, our, it, it, the fourth watch of the night, right? You look at that. The night is divided into four sections of three hours, right? So darkness starts at six. Like they've got 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark. So they've been rowing for nine hours and not getting anywhere. 
And you got to say, why did God let them suffer for nine hours before he comes in the last minute? Think about this, friends. If God would have come in the first hour, would they have been as grateful? No. They had to wrestle for nine hours, recognizing we're using the best of our skills. We're accomplished fishermen. We've been on this sea our whole lives, doing everything we can, and all we're doing is keeping the boat from sinking. That's it. We're not getting to the other side. We're stuck. The storm is too strong. But human effort's important, isn't it? Because if they wouldn't have fought, they would have sunk, right? So that's the analogy for our life, isn't it? We're on the storm of the sea, and you've got to use all of your power, all of your intellect, your whole heart, mind, and strength to fight against the sea of desire that wishes to wreck your ship. But realize this, if God doesn't come into the picture, if Jesus doesn't come into the picture, you're never going to get to the other side. You're just going to be fighting your whole life, and that's exhausting. So realize that you need to exercise your part. You need to fight against temptation. But realize that there comes a point, right, that you need God. And we all better figure it out, right? Because that's the only way we're getting to the other side of the shore. And it's really remarkable. Peter, he's so beautiful. He's so pig-headed sometimes, but sometimes he really gets it right. What do the fathers say about this? It's really remarkable because a lot of people think he doubts Jesus is there, but he's not, he's not doubting. He says, look at this. Do you perceive with what ardor Peter was burning? This is John Chrysostom. He's a better preacher by me than a long shot. Okay, He's a saint and doctor of the church. Do you see how great his faith was even then? No one loved Jesus so much as he did. Not only did he manifest charity, but faith also. He believed not only that Christ was walking upon the sea, but that he was able to give the same power to others. He dared to ask for this power in order that he might more quickly be with Jesus. Wow. I'm not going to wait for him to come to the boat. I want you to tell me to go out there right now and be with you. See his passion? See that? But what causes him to fall is he takes his eyes off Jesus and looks at the waves. And if you look and you have the TV on all the time, friends, you're going to sink. Because you look at all the lies that are happening right now that are being revealed about our politicians and about everything that they've been lying to you for three years, from the health organizations to the government, to every single person you can imagine, they've been lying to you, and it can make you as mad as hell. But friends, you've got to put your eyes on Jesus, because we've always known the world's lying to you. It's not a surprise. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. If you're looking for government to tell you the truth, dream on! Dream on. That's not in their best interest. Their best interest is to stay in power. Do you think they're going to lie? Yes. They will do anything it takes to stay in power. He's the only one who didn't come to do his own will, but the will of the Father. He's not interested in power. He has all the power. He doesn't have to prove anything. And if you believe he's the one walking in the midst of our world right now and can bring the storm to an end right now, you're going to beg him, Lord, let me walk on the water with you. Another saint, beautiful, says this. St. Augustine, for every man, his desire is a storm. If you love God, you walk upon the water. Under your feet is the fear of the world. If you love the world, it will swallow you up. It knows how to devour its lovers not support them. Yet, when your heart wavers with desire, call on Christ's divinity that you may conquer your desires. I think we'll leave it there. Realize this, friends. God, he's that presence on the sea. The sea is the thing that's making big noises. Jesus is walking calmly on the water. He brings peace wherever he goes. And that's the story here. Oftentimes we're looking for God to do a profound manifest work. And sometimes he does. But as Elijah discovered, it wasn't the earthquake. It wasn't the wind. It wasn't the fire. It was the still, small voice. And until, friends, we take time and quiet to listen to him, you're never going to be able to discern what God is doing. If you keep your life immersed in the TV and the radio... All day long, friends, you will never hear God unless he shouts. And most of the time he doesn't. He speaks very quietly. So let's enter into this time. Let's ask the Lord to attune our ears and give us the grace this week to pray and to look at him so we're not sunk. Come Holy Spirit.